just want to make two points. One is I really appreciated Kenneth's uh, point about either retrofitting or finding areas that teachers find problematic. Um, he was too polite to say, but I, I don't have to worry. Like he, I don't have to be elected. Uh, uh, just to say that there's a it, retrofitting is not a great idea if you want to engender change. Not because there's anything bad about it. I mean, if you, we use technology to enhance what we would have done anyway. Uh, and that's not such a bad thing. The problem is that at the end of the day, the teacher looks at the retrofitted attempt and says, is it really worth it? Do, I, do we really have to spend this money? Do I really have to take this effort? Do I really have to change everything? Just so there's a minor perturbation in, my, in the system. And let me just, on the other side, uh, you know, we have a, a saying in, in England, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Um, and there are a lot of things that are broken for teachers that are problematic for teachers. But I just wanted to add one word. It's also a route into parents. That parents feel in every country that I've ever visited, and please tell me I'm wrong about Hong Kong, but in every country parents are dissatisfied about their children's education. <laughs> that's a kind of, uh, that's always true. And technology uh, suitably designed and suitably used can address some of the sometimes legitimate fears of parents and sometimes illegitimate, but still can help parents to see a better way. I just wanted to make one second point that's completely unrelated to that, and that's the uh, gentleman who talked about uh, negative effects. Um, you, you might be surprised, but I think he's right. I think that there are negative effects of technology that is misused, uh, just like there are negative effects of printing. In my country you can uh, see really things displayed in public places on printed media that you wouldn't want your children to see. And uh, that doesn't mean to say we have to give up reading papers and reading books. But uh, it remind, I wanted to just share with you uh, Celia and I have just done a research project looking as deeply as we could at the kinds of knowledge that employees in a large variety of sectors need in the 21st century. By the way, that's now, that's not 2020. And it turns out there are things that they no longer need to know. In my own subject, for example, it is completely mad that we spend time teaching people how to divide obscure fractions by other obscure fractions. But it turns out that there are new things that people, ordinary people, need to know that were unthinkable before. And I just, if I have time, can I just share with you a shocking example of what I mean that, that I came across a few months ago? One minute. There's a website which states conclusively that global warming doesn't exist. And it contains the following sentence. There is no evidence for the human beings affecting climate change. The only evidence exists in the form of computer programs. I, I find this a completely shocking thing that anybody could say that and be fairly assured that people will nod their head and say, yeah, well, it's only a computer program. Uh, what other kind of evidence are you supposed to have for the effect of global warming in the year 2050? So I think we have to, that's a new kind of knowledge that people need. What is a computer program? What does it mean to isolate the key variables? What does it mean to build a mathematical model? Everybody needs to know that, not just mathematicians. And that's the kind of new knowledge that we have to find space for in our curriculum. And I think it's impossible to achieve that without technology. So, um, you, one minute? <laughs> one minute for one or three points. <laughs> yeah. First of all, I think this is a, there's a, global campaign going on, uh, it, it, it is a matter of learning rather than a matter of technology. And, uh, and I, I, ha I have to say that the, uh, the basic concept, that the basic theme of the campaign is still rather unclear to everybody. It is clear to uh, the, the convergent view but there are still a lot of people, even in education circle, or even training and education research institutions, who don't think that, that, that learning or e-learning has anything to do with their 
a daily routine. And uh, so I think we, we have to, to uh, we need champions like uh, in Hong Kong, like uh, Nancy. But now we also have champions in the political arena, like uh, Kenneth. And the, the second thing is building alliances. It, it's a campaign. Therefore, if you really want to engineer, you have to build alliances. Those who are not in the core business of education, but will be sympathetic and will be supportive. But with that, I think international networking is important. Uh, I, I strongly suggest that a meeting like us, a conference like us, should be should have dialogues with OECD, with UNESCO, with World Bank, because the the notion the, the notion of learning is now emerging on all of their education agendas, and we move fast, and we can put in the right kind of message. Otherwise, they might go astray. Um, but I have to add that e-learning will come anyway, depends on what kind of, of speed. And in many countries, in developing countries, they may not go through computer, they go through mobile phones even more easily. However, what is the real challenge is actually the, the learning in the ethical values, moral dimensions, uh, how e-learning could also uh, facilitate that kind of learning, I think it's a real challenge. Thank you very much. Um, just um, to close, I want like one minute. I think to me, <laughs> um, a kind of, a, you know, I don't know the solution to the question I asked, but I sort of vaguely have the image that we, the, the kind of solution would be to build an architecture for learning. We, we've been, you know, thinking, I mean, there's a lot of talk about, you know, learning organizations, and so it's learning individuals. We all have to change. And the alignment, how can we align? I think the only way we can align is through learning. And how can we build networks of learning, and networks of networks of learning? I think that's been permeating from all, you know, who's been speaking. So alliances is the same. So how can we build um, you know, networks that link together internationally and locally and, and also, you know, how can technicians, how can we form communities of technicians who do not feel that they are forced to work with us, but they also feel proud that they're contributing to the same enterprise. So how can we build architectures for learning? And I think, uh, and, I, and over the last few days, I've learned so much. So I would like to thank all of you for your participation, for your contribution. I would also like to thank all our co-organizers, um, the EDB, uh, Microsoft Partners in Learning, our co-sponsors, the Strategic Research Team on Learning Sciences in Hong Kong U, uh, Promethean, and um, the um, Education um, Technology um, Corporation. And of course, to all of you, especially for those of you who've come so far. So thank you very much, and have a great weekend. And for those of you who have come off, uh, I hope you will enjoy, um, if you're staying longer, enjoy Hong Kong, and have a great trip home. Thank you.